A report released today names the top 10 endangered rivers. Number one is the Snake River, once the largest salmon producer in the Columbia River Basin. Today its salmon runs are on the brink of extinction. The loss of salmon is an existential threat to Northwest tribes who depend on the fish for their culture and identity. Alyssa Macy breaks down this for us. She's from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Oregon, and she's the CEO of the Washington Environmental Council. All of these rivers face different perils, but the Snake River needs drastic and quick action to save it, which has played such an important part in tribal livelihoods. Welcome, Alyssa. Hello, great to be here today with you. As you know, I grew up on the Snake River drainage and uh, salmon fishing was always a big part of our treaty responsibility. And I'm really intrigued that uh, the idea that the American Rivers is saying treaty rights are part of this uh, endangerment. Absolutely. American Rivers does a report um, annually where they look at endangered rivers across the country. And there's a couple of factors that they take into account. One is the magnitude of the threat. The second is the significance to the river, uh, of the river to the people and to nature. And the third uh, piece that they look at is a critical decision point. So the Snake River has landed as the number one most endangered river on this report for the fact that uh, the, the salmon runs in the Lower Snake River are getting close to extinction. We know as native peoples here in the Pacific Northwest um, and throughout uh, the entire West Coast region, like salmon's not just important to you know, the tribes along the Columbia River and the Snake River. It's important to tribes throughout this entire region, all the way up through Alaska, all the way down to California, as part of our identity, as part of our subsistence. Um, and certainly uh, fishing is a part of our treaty rights that we have secured um, in, you know, hundreds of years ago. So this river has been named um, because of the threat of extinction, because of its significance to tribal people, to the economy, to the region, and also the fact that we have an opportunity right now here in front of us to take bold action to address what the Snake River is facing right now. Of course, one of the big challenges, and I guess the political challenge, let's just say it, is the dams and how the dams have changed the very nature of the Snake River. Maybe talk about that. Absolutely. So there are four dams on the Lower Snake River. Um, what they have done by damming up the river is to basically prevent the free flow of water in the river. Salmon need to go upriver to spawn. They need to be able to travel. Um, there has been millions and millions and millions of dollars spent on fish passage, ways for fish to sort of get around these uh, dams that are, that are along the river. It has not been successful. Salmon numbers continue to decline. So what we are looking at now is really, how do we address this particular issue? What happens to the water that backs up behind the rivers? Well, it gets warmer. That is not something that helps salmon. Um, it also increases the chance of things like algae growing. It, it changes the temperature. It changes the, the ability for fish to really be successful in, in returning and spawning and, and being a part of the ecosystem in the way that they are. So what we're looking to do and a part of uh, proposing along with Representative Simpson from Idaho is to look for a comprehensive solution to this issue. This includes a serious conversation about breaching or removing the four dams on the Lower Snake River. And really what we're talking about here is perhaps a little bit of break in energy costs, but really it's barging and farmers taking stuff to market that could go a lot of other ways, is it not? Yeah, it is. This, you know, I think where folks get afraid is it, when we talk about breaching a dam or removing a dam, that kind of gets everybody's attention, right? Uh, Representative Simpson has put forward a $33.5 billion proposal that doesn't just look at the removal of the dams. This also looks at how do we replace the energy that is being uh, uh, generated by these dams? So what is the alternative energy source that we have to create? So this is a really exciting opportunity to, to basically um, invest in energy uh, that's produced in the region, to look at the ways that we do commerce in the region, like how will goods get to port? That's a big piece of it. How does agriculture play into this? How does recreation and tourism play into this? So his proposal is not just looking at one piece. It's a comprehensive proposal to look at everything that salmon touches. Um, and, and I think this is a, an, an issue where we say Tri-Cities, you know, Idaho, Eastern Washington, 
Um, but really it touches on issues here in the Puget Sound area, because as you know, one of the things that we, we talk about a lot here in the Pacific Northwest, and in, in particular the Puget Sound area is the orcas. And we, there's so many campaigns about saving the orcas. Yes, and if you wanna save the orcas, we need to talk about salmon. Uh, and you mentioned the sports fishery. I remember um, a few years ago driving to Riggins, Idaho, and uh, when I was a kid, you'd see bumper stickers like coal is providing dollars and jobs. And yet now when you go through Riggins, Idaho, you see a bumper sticker that says this job is saved by salmon because um, the industry has become something where people around the world know it and go there for that. Absolutely. Recreational fishing um, is a huge thing in the Pacific Northwest and salmon are a crucial component of that. Uh, American Rivers reported that in the Pacific Northwest, um, recreational fishing and tourism generates more than $5.3 billion a year in economic development and also uh, accounts for 36,000 jobs. So this isn't just about, you know, saving fish. This is about saving an important piece of the Pacific Northwest identity um, and a very important economic piece for many communities in uh, the eastern part of Washington and in Idaho that don't have a lot of opportunity for economic development. I live in Central Oregon, um, you know, I sort of grew up, uh, that's where my community is from. Recreational fishing along the Deschutes River is a huge thing. It's a huge thing. People come from all over the world to fish along that river. Similarly, they do the same thing along the snake. So why, when we talk about saving the salmon, we're also talking about saving that important piece of our economy. We think of the modern environmental movement and it's largely been a white organization and your appointment, I think, but also the conversations in environmentalism about how diversity is critical to getting this right. And I just wanna hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I came here, um, before I was uh, here at Washington Environmental Council, Washington Conservation Voters, I served as the COO for my nation in Central Oregon. It was a great opportunity to work for my own tribe. Um, it was a huge learning curve, so many things that tribal nations are thinking about, challenges that they're grappling with. One of the things that I that I have felt my whole life is the place where you see treaty rights exercise the most is when it comes to our natural resources, lands, territories, and resources, and Indian child welfare. Um, I have been drawn to the work here at Washington Environmental Council for a couple of reasons. One, um, both organizations have over 80 years of experience working here in the state of Washington, done some really great work, have also done some things that have not included um, all of the stakeholders and certainly tribal nations in the past. I came here also because there was a journey that this organization has been on, a racial equity journey, some commitments that have been made and some work that had been previously done. So when I decided to, to come here, I felt like it was safe enough that there was enough progress uh, being made. There was a very strong foundation and I felt like this was a place where I could do some good work. One of the things that I've learned um, very quickly uh, in the past year is there's a lot of opportunity for environmental organizations um, like the one that I'm currently working for um, and the environmental justice community to do a better job of working with tribal nations. I do see a lot of reference to the term BIPOC. Um, I think that term is very problematic because of the I. Um, the I assumes a lot of different things. Indigenous peoples, yes. Tribal nations, yes. So how do we actually engage with tribal nations that are respectful um, and, and ways that we can really turn the tide instead of standing behind tribes and their treaty rights when we wanna stop a fossil fuel terminal um, but really engaging with tribes to develop the campaigns to do so. So I think there's this great opportunity to do better. Um, the, at WEC and WCV, um, we are shifting the way that we do work to make sure that we engage with tribal nations in a respectful way. So I'm looking forward to the journey here in the state of Washington and hopefully setting example for other historically white-led environmental organizations to be better partners um, with tribal nations, not only here in Washington, but across the country. Thank you so much, Alyssa Macy.